Hello, welcome to Earth Science. I am going to go ahead and share my screen with you and we are going to look at today's lesson. Get this out of the way. There we go. So we're going to go through, um, we're going to look at the Unit 5 Weather and Climate Module and we're going to move down here to today's date and the lesson on wind. So we're going to go through this um, we're going to start off with doing the bell work. The bell work is just a really quick, um, tell me a little bit about what you know about wind already. So how would you define wind? What else can you tell me about it? Once you've made your reply, you'll be able to see the responses from your classmates, and you're going to go in and respond to two of them as well. Once you've done that, you are finished with the bell work, and you're going to come back in here. And I'm going to shrink my video here. So once you've done that, you're going to come back in here and you are going to join us for the bulk of the lesson. So pause me, go do your bell work, and then come right back. All right, welcome back. So you should have done the bell work up here. Um, the rest of the class period, we're going to be taking some notes. Um, watching a couple videos and doing a homework assignment all to learn about wind, wind patterns, atmospheric heating, all of that. So this image probably isn't gonna make a lot of sense to you right now, but this is a summary of all of the different wind cells and wind patterns um, that help create our weather patterns, our wind systems, our climates on earth. And you can see by looking at this, that what happens in the Northern Hemisphere actually repeats in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you look at the equator here in the middle, on either side, you have the Hadley cells and you have the easterly trade winds. Um, easterly means it comes from the east and goes to the west. Outside of the Hadley cells going both directions, you have the mid-latitude cells and the westerly winds. And then at the poles on each end, you have the polar cells. Each of these little bubble looking things is a pattern of convection that happens. What goes up must come down. So when the wind goes up one side, it moves across the atmosphere, comes down the other side, moves across the surface, goes back up. And it's a big circle like the conveyor belt that pushes your groceries along when you check out at the grocery store. This is also the same type of convection cells that you see in uh, the internal layers of the earth with the movement of the magma inside the earth. So let's jump right in to our notes for the day. So we're gonna talk about winds. We're gonna first look at atmospheric heating, then we're gonna look at the global and local winds. So for atmospheric heating, you need to be able to explain how energy travels from the sun to the earth what the differences are between radiation conduction and convection, and then why Earth's atmosphere is so warm. So our image on the right over here shows examples of the three types of energy transfer that we're gonna look at. Conduction is by touch. Convection is some type of fluid movement, and then radiation is uh, transferring it through waves. So electromagnetic waves, not waves that you can see. So let's jump right in. Remember that when we're doing notes, if you ever need a little bit more time on a slide, it's totally fine. Uh, you can always pause my video, finish up your slide, and then restart the video when you're done. <clears throat> Completely acceptable to do that. Um, I'm not taking a lot of extra time, or leaving you a lot of extra time to copy stuff down while we're going through this so that I don't end up with people fast forwarding and that kind of thing. Um, so just pause the video, catch up, and then restart it. So energy traveling from the sun to the earth, how does this happen? Well, it's going to happen by a method called radiation. Radiation is electromagnetic waves that transfer energy. So it's going to flow from the sun to the earth as this electromagnetic wave. It's not a wave you can see. Um, it's basically just a stream of light and energy that is directed towards us. 
that energy gets absorbed by air, water, land. It can get reflected. It can get turned into heat energy. There's all kinds of things that can happen to this. Um, and this energy is actually going to be what causes changes in wind, ocean currents, weather. Um, it causes our water cycle. And we're going to look at all of that. So this image here is just a quick visual of what happens to radiation from the sun. About half of that radiation is absorbed by Earth's surface. The other half is dealt with in the atmosphere. It can be absorbed. It can be scattered or reflected by clouds or gases. Um, it can also be reflected by the surface of the Earth. And how it's dealt with um, is what causes the changes here at the surface. So changes in weather, changes in um, ocean currents, those kinds of things. So we're going to start off by looking at heat transfer by contact. This is called conduction, more specifically thermal conduction. Um, it's the transfer of energy by touching two materials together. So transferring heat energy by touching two materials together is thermal conduction. So if you have something that's hot and something that's cold, this is an unstable, unequal system. It is not an equilibrium, it's not balanced. What do we know about systems? They want to be balanced. They want to reach equilibrium. In order to do that, you have to transfer things from high energy to low energy. Well, things that are warmer have a higher energy than things that are colder. So that heat energy gets transferred from warm to cold. Doesn't require any assistance, doesn't require any help or any outside energy influences, nothing, it just happens. So it goes from warm to cold and it tries to balance that out so they become an equal temperature. And that is thermal conduction when heat energy is moved by touch. An example of this, if you are out walking around on a beach and you take your sandals off, when your feet touch that beach, if it's a warm, sunny day, that sand is going to feel a little bit warm, maybe even hot to you. And that is heat transferring from the sand that's hot to your bottom of your foot, which is cooler. The second way heat is transferred is by motion. This is called convection. So remember the convection currents from when we talked about layers of the earth and we talked about the magma rising and falling? The same thing's gonna happen here. It's that conveyor belt in the grocery store that moves your groceries at the checkout line. It goes up, across, down, across, and it's a big cycle. So what happens during convection for heat transfer? Well, as your liquid, we're gonna call it water for our purposes today, but it can be any liquid. Um, it can also be any gas such as air. So when that heats up, that warmer water is going to start rising to the top. Anything that is warmer is gonna be less dense than things that are colder. So the warmer water is gonna to rise to the top. As it reaches the top of the um, liquid that's in the pot, as it reaches the top of that, it's going to start cooling off. When it cools off, it becomes more dense and it's going to sink to the bottom. So hot, less dense, rises, cool, more dense, falls. And it's going to keep having that pattern over and over. So hot, less dense, rises, cool, more dense, falls, over and over. <clears throat> that circular movement is a convection current. We're going to take a look on the next slide of a diagram of this. You don't have to write this slide down. This is just reiterating what we just talked about. So if you wrote it down on the slide before, you already have this slide written down. But basically, convection is the transfer of thermal energy by circulation. So you're moving it through a liquid or a gas. We've got an image here of the cycle spelled out for you. 
So you've got the wind happening at the surface. As it goes across, it gets warmer. As the air warms, it rises. Less dense, warm air is on top. As it moves across the atmosphere, it's gonna release that heat into the cooler air around it. It's gonna cool off and it's gonna sink because it's more dense and then we start over again. You need to be able to explain what's going on in this picture step by step. So you have the winds moving across the surface. Um, it starts off cool when it sinks. As it moves across the surface, it absorbs heat from the surface. It warms up, starts rising up into the atmosphere. As it gets near the top of the cell here, it's gonna start moving across because it's lost a lot of its heat. Um, it's getting heat released into the air around it, the atmosphere around it, it cools off. Um, it starts sinking again, and then we start over. All right, you need to be able to answer these three questions. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to think about this, jot these answers down in your notebook, and then we'll talk about them. Go ahead and pause me, get all of this written down, and then come back. All right, welcome back. So question number one goes back to that pot of water. We're boiling water in a pot. Um, it wants to know, does it heat up by conduction, convection, or radiation? So how does the pot heat up? Let's actually go take a look at this pot again. Um, we're actually in this image looking at all three types of heat transfer. It's asking specifically about the pot heating up so you have a pot sitting on a burner. They're touching each other. Hopefully you came up with conduction for that part. You have a pot touching the burner. The heat is directly transferred by touch. That's conduction. You're also, if you look at the liquid inside, seeing convection. And if you look at these energy waves coming off of it, that's gonna be radiation. So in the image, you're looking at all three types, but what it's asking about is how does the pot itself heat up? And that would be conduction. <clears throat> so in this one, number two, what's happening when the water begins to boil, that's convection. And you need to be explaining the rise and fall of the liquid of different temperatures. Number three, if you roast a marshmallow, what type is it? This is going to be radiation. Um, we're assuming that the marshmallow never touches any solid material from the fire, so it can't be conduction. Um, and the heat's being released as electromagnetic waves. So that is going to be radiation for how you cook the marshmallow. All right, so how do we stay warm? You guys have probably heard of the greenhouse effect. And hopefully you guys have all seen a greenhouse. Sometimes they're made of glass, sometimes they're made of plastic. Um, but basically what you have is a specific material that's coated in a way that the sun's energy waves come in. As they hit the surface down here, it gets turned into heat. That heat cannot escape, so it's trapped in here. So it is warmer inside the greenhouse than it is outside. That is how a greenhouse works. That's also how our atmosphere works. And that's how we end up with the greenhouse effect. Um, our atmosphere acts as like an insulating blanket or the, the outside base of a greenhouse. And it traps that heat energy in um, after the energy from the sun comes in and gets transferred into heat. Uh, so how does that work? We talked about the layers of the atmosphere and how different gases absorb different things or reflect different things. Um, so the gases in our atmosphere, specifically water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, those are going to all absorb heat energy that's reflected back from the Earth's surface. That's going to cause our atmosphere to get warmer. And that's what causes what we call the greenhouse effect, the warming of our atmosphere. Now, a little bit of greenhouse effect is necessary and even good for the planet because this is what allows the planet to maintain a stable temperature to support life. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, we would not have life on the planet. However, 
you can have too much of a good thing. A little bit of greenhouse, good. Lots of greenhouse, very bad. Uh, if you get it too hot, it becomes unbearable. We have temperatures that we just cannot survive in and we are going to die off, go extinct. So we need to maintain that balance. Um, greenhouse gases, the two that are most important are probably gonna be carbon dioxide for one. Um, water vapor is gonna trap a lot. Um, really, you probably should know all four, methane and nitrous oxide as well, but carbon dioxide is the big one. Carbon dioxide is the one that's actually causing us the problem right now. We're releasing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the earth is able to take out. And that's what is causing global warming. So again, the greenhouse effect, that's the atmosphere trapping in heat so it can't escape and warming up the surface of the earth. So what is global warming? I mentioned the greenhouse effect is causing it. So basically what happens is all of those greenhouse gases trap in heat. And we've got a lot of carbon dioxide that we're putting out into the atmosphere exhaust from our cars, byproducts from factories, um, burning fossil fuels for energy or heat. Um, a fossil fuel is anything that came from an organic origin. So coal, oil, even gas to an extent. Um, when we burn coal and oil for fuel, we put off so many greenhouse gases. So much carbon dioxide gets released from that. It's crazy. We're putting out way more than the earth was meant to handle because it, you know, humans came up with all of these industrialization processes. Um, these are not things that happened before humans. So we're putting out all of this extra carbon dioxide over and above what was meant to be in the atmosphere. As we're doing this, we're burning these fossil fuels, we're putting out exhaust from our cars, our factories. Um, we're also cutting down trees. We're clear cutting entire forests to make room for new developments, cities. Um, we're burning forests out. Um, we're basically removing the plant life that removes the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Remember that plant matter takes in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen in that photosynthesis process. So not only are we adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we're removing the planet's method to clean it up. So we're creating this huge gap between the amount getting put out and the amount getting taken away. And it's just making more and more carbon dioxide build up in the atmosphere, which makes it get warmer and warmer because it traps more and more heat. It's a vicious cycle. As we keep going through this, this is what we call global warming. So it's that increase of the global temperature. Eventually, we're gonna reach a breaking point and we're gonna get to a point where it's gonna snap and go the opposite direction um, because the earth is gonna have to rebalance itself. We're gonna get stronger weather, stronger storms, um, crazy climate changes. And the earth is gonna try and put itself back in balance because remember in nature, everything tries to maintain equilibrium. <coughs> and if that happens, we may end up finding ourselves in another ice age. So how do we fix this? Well, we can start using clean energy, wind power, solar power, hydroelectric power from water, um, moving water. We can stop cutting down forests stop clearing out lands um, to make new cities. We can increase the amount of green spaces, plant some trees, all kinds of things we can do. We're gonna have a unit on climate change um, or a lesson on climate change. So we'll save the soapbox for that, sorry. We're gonna go ahead and continue on to winds. We're gonna look at global and local. So we're gonna be able to answer what causes winds. Um, we're gonna talk about what the Coriolis effect is. 
and we're going to look at the major wind systems on the planet. Now, there's a couple of videos listed down here. These are also linked on the slides. Um, so if you want to watch them all at once, you can. If you want to watch them on the individual slides, you'll be able to see the links then as well. This is just a summary image of the different wind patterns, and we'll talk about all of these as we go through. So first of all, we need to know what causes the wind. Wind is caused by differences in air pressure. So air pressure differences cause the air to move from one area to another, and that's what we call wind. It's gonna move from areas of high pressure to low pressure, because remember that moving high to low happens without any assistance or extra energy input. It just happens. It's that maintaining balance. Everything in nature wants to maintain a balance. The higher the difference, or the more the difference in pressure you have, the faster the air is gonna move, the harder the wind is gonna blow. You can demonstrate this by blowing up a balloon and holding it closed. Inside the balloon, you have high air pressure. Outside the balloon, you have lower air pressure. So when you release it, you're going to have a wind come out the bottom of that balloon. <clears throat> so it's going to have a massive burst of wind come out. You're going to have that high air pressure releasing into the low, and that's actually going to cause the balloon to shoot off in the opposite direction. So we talked a little bit about air pressure before when we talked about the layers of the atmosphere. We talked about air pressure getting lower as we get further out because of the pull of gravity being less. There's one other thing that does affect air pressure and that's the temperature of the air. Temperature differences are gonna happen because different areas, different gases absorb the energy from the sun differently. The more it absorbs, the warmer it gets. As you are near the equator, you get more direct sunlight. You absorb more heat energy, so it's warmer. When you get towards the poles, you're going to have less heat energy, less absorbed. It's going to be colder. That's more indirect light. So remember that warm air is not as dense as cold air. Warm is less dense than cold. So because it's less dense, it's going to rise. So warm air rises cool air falls. That's also coincidentally why you have um, issues if you have a multi-level home. The rooms upstairs are gonna be a little bit warmer than the rooms downstairs because warm air rises and your heating system, your ventilation system has to try and regulate that by pushing the air around. So again, we're looking at convection cells. And this image is a little bit weird. It's basically got the Earth tipped on its side. So the equator is pointing up, the North Pole's on the right, South Pole's on the left. Um, so if you're looking at this, you're gonna see areas of high and low pressure. Anytime you have air rising, that's gonna create pockets of low pressure because it's moving up and kind of pulling away from the surface. If you have air falling, that's gonna be high pressure because it's getting pulled down towards the surface. So it's getting pulled down on top of you instead of pushed up off of you. It's like a blanket coming down on you versus being pulled away from you. Um, with our wind patterns, we have these convection cells and they're always gonna be opposite because the wind is always gonna rise and fall the same. So they're gonna flow in opposite directions. So this cell comes down at the high pressure, this cell comes down at the high pressure. The cell goes up at the low pressure, this cell goes up at the low pressure. You do need to be aware of this convection pattern and what causes the high and low pressure. So we're gonna be looking at specific types of winds or wind patterns. This image kind of shows you the convection cells here. Um, these fluffy looking white bubbly things are the wind cells. And then we're gonna be looking at the types of winds. So westerlies move from the west, um, easterlies or trade winds move from the east, 
And then you have the polar winds down here at the bottom. And these are being called easterlies because these are going from east to west in this image. So we're gonna look at trade winds westerlies and polar easterlies. Um, we've got a video here on global winds. So you should pause me, take a look at this video, watch it, and then come back. All right. So what are the three main global wind belts? We've got trade winds, westerlies, and polar easterlies. Trade winds are from 30 degrees in latitude almost to the equator, and they're going to curve to the west um, as they blow towards the equator. So these are also sometimes called easterlies because they move east to west, and they're always going to go towards the equator. Westerlies go from 30 degrees to 60 degrees latitude on either side, and these are going to blow towards the poles, so the opposite direction. They also start from the opposite direction. They go west to east. Most of the U.S. is in these westerly winds. That's why we get our weather from California. <clears throat> so these are going to carry um, all of the air across the U.S. from west to east. It gives us rain, snow, shine. It gives us all of our weather patterns. Polar easterlies are obviously going to be at each pole. 60 degrees all the way up to 90. Um, these are super cold. Um, the sinking air is gonna move away from the poles. In the Northern hemisphere, it's gonna carry cold Arctic air over the United States. When we have um, those really, really cold snaps, that is some of these polar easterlies pushing that cold air down. So which one of these affects our weather the most? Hopefully you remember. Okay, that is the westerlies. <coughs> so in this image, you're looking at the different types of winds. Um, and this will be a little bit more clear on your screen. Um, it's not showing up great on mine when I full screen it. Um, so maybe shrink down to not full screen on this one to be able to read it a little bit easier. Um, but this is going to show you the different um, types of winds where they're at. Go ahead and take a look at this. There's a question over here that says, the, notice the winds don't move straight. Why do you think they curve? and doldrum, we are going to learn about why the wind curves. So this is what's called the Coriolis effect. So the wind is actually blowing straight, but remember that the earth is rotating. We don't just sit still, we spin. So as the earth spins or rotates, those straight winds are going to appear to curve because the earth is moving underneath them. And that is what is called the Coriolis effect. So as we rotate, places near the equator are moving faster than places closer to the poles. That difference in speed causes that appearance of the curve in the wind. It also causes the deflection east or west. Be able to explain and understand what the Coriolis effect is. There will be questions about the Coriolis effect on the test. <coughs> so this is a visual of how the Coriolis effect happens on um, that curving path causes these straight paths to kind of deflect here. There's two videos here for you to watch about the Coriolis effect. Go ahead and pause my video and please watch both of these. You will need the information from all of these videos in order to complete your homework. 
All right. So let's take a look really quickly at the jet stream. So the jet stream is basically a really narrow belt of high speed winds. Um, it's in the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. It's actually where airplanes like to catch it and fly if it's going the same direction as them because it gives them kind of a tailwind and a boost. Um, it can reach up to 400 kilometers an hour and it always goes west to east and it goes all the way around the world. So jet streams can move. So instead of being like a regular global wind system that's always kind of in the same place, the jet stream can shift from day to day. This can also affect where storms will go, how they move. Um, so we try to track the jet stream so we can kind of see the pattern that storms are gonna fall or follow and where they're gonna end up to predict um, where the storms are heading. All right, let's talk about local winds. There's another video here for you to watch. So go ahead and pause me and watch this video here. Um, and then try to describe one difference between global and local winds. Local winds are basically gonna be um, just in one area. They don't surround the globe. Um, examples of local winds. This is the difference between wind night and day. Let's take a look at this image and see kind of how the lay of the land affects the wind here locally. I'm going to pause the video to look this over if you need to. Um, types of local winds you've got mountain breezes, valley breezes. And these are based off of or affected by geography. You can have sea breezes. Um, it's basically something that happens in a local area. So this is the end of our notes here. And um, we're gonna come down here. You have two more videos to watch here after the notes. So go ahead and watch these. I'm gonna go through the homework with you really quickly before you do that. Um, and then I'll let you go so you can watch these last two videos. You do need to watch these before you attempt the homework because they do have some of the answers in them. So here's the assignment page for the homework. You're gonna click this link to make a copy of the document that has all the answers and questions on it. Um, you're gonna use your notes and the lesson slides. You can also use Google if you need to. And then you're gonna update your completed answers using the Google Drive tab to submit it. Here is what it looks like. You're gonna click make a copy. And you're gonna fill in this document. So you've got that image from the assignment page here that has all of the different wins on it. And then you have some questions to answer here. Diagram, okay. Questions about the Coriolis effect. So answer all of these questions, turn this in using the submit button and attaching it with the Google Drive tab. Once you finish this, you've watched all the videos, you've taken the notes, you did the bell work, then you are done for the day. And you can go ahead and close out. Please keep in mind, we are nearing the end of the semester. So if you have makeup work, you need to be getting that done and turned in as soon as possible um, so that you can get your makeup points for that and help boost your grades. We will see you next time.